Philippians chapter 1, we're going to read from verse 27 again. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you, or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake, having the same conflict which He saw in me, and now here to be in me. Amen. Let's still our hearts, beloved. Lord, we commit now this time to Thee. We pray for power to declare Thy Word, not for the wisdom of man, but for the power of God. We ask that Thou wilt use this instrument now to declare Thy truth in such a way that not only will the Word have free course, but that it may be glorified, and that Thou wilt use it to be applicable to every soul gathered here this morning. So help us, fill us with wisdom and power, grace and love, And do thine own work now, extending thy kingdom and glorifying Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. While the gospel is good news, it is not a call to easy living. There is always a price when one embraces the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. To give us the good news required the Son of God to give his life. And to receive the good news requires us to give over our lives. This is the message of the New Testament. Jesus suffered to deliver us from that which we could not deliver ourselves from. And we are called to suffer in ways which are not dictated by ourselves. We are called to follow His lead, follow His example, and go wherever He would have us go. The gospel, rightly understood, calls us to repentance, to self-denial, and the complete surrender of our lives to His Lordship. Now, for many of you, that goes without saying, but to some, that may be new. We are called to be willing to suffer reproach, to give up popularity, and at times to sacrifice ourselves, our possessions, and our comforts. Jesus suffered to bring us the gospel, and we must suffer to own it. This is the message of the New Testament. When we come to verse 27 of the first chapter, we have the first exhortations being brought by the Apostle Paul. And it calls us, as we have said before, to heavenly living. Salvation, you see, is not a one-time action. It's a lifetime affair. We need to get a hold of that. It is not, I prayed a prayer. It is, I am living a life. We are called to conduct ourselves as heavenly citizens, the heavenly citizens we claim to be. It's not just, I'm going to heaven, but I am a citizen of heaven, heaven already. The entire letter prior to verse 27 has not called us to anything. But by the example of the Apostle Paul, it has made some sharp application to us. It has hit home, and I trust has been used of God to shape us and help us to understand what God calls us to be. And we would be tempted, if we read just up to verse 26, perhaps just to be spectators of Paul's life, because essentially, from verse 12 through 26, All we have is Paul talking about his own experience. And one may debate about what applies to us and what does not. What the Lord requires of us and what He doesn't. As we see Him live a heavenly life, we might question whether or not we are called to the same extent of Christian living. But Paul takes no chances. I like the spirit of the Apostle Paul. And when he comes to verse 27, he starts hammering home 
how his example is not something that is unique. But we are, all of us who name the name of Christ, called to the same heavenly lifestyle. We are called to self-denial. We are called to put down our own reputations in order that the gospel may go forward. We are called to, when we are confronted with the options of life and death, leave the matter in the hand of God. He launches his readers in verse 27 to consider this command, and it is a command, to heavenly living. And then, following that command, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, he then goes on to give signs of a heavenly people. And that's what we considered last week. Certain signs that will be distinctive of the heavenly lifestyle where we find that we will stand in unity, we will strive for orthodoxy, we will show bravery. These things are the things we looked at last week. And these signs are signs that must be found in us all, beloved. Unity is not an option. Unity is necessity for the body of Christ. Truth is not an option. Truth is something we are to fight for and hold to tenaciously. And I'll just make this application because in the past week I was confronted with a reminder of how little people think about truth at times, where it is all about their feelings over what God has said. And if you say to someone, here's what God's Word says, they so easily nowadays get offended. They don't want to be attacked. They get defensive. And they will go so far as to just cut you off from their friendship because you challenge them. And that is blatantly unbiblical. So unbiblical. Even when we are putting our noses in places where perhaps one feels we should not be putting them, and we are overstepping our mark of calling someone out or saying something to someone, we are not given permission ever to be sensitive. We are not allowed to get this kind of, oh, how dare you? As if, as if we're the finished article. Because that's what we imply, isn't it? When someone comes and says, you know, brother, you know, sister, I don't agree with you here, or this, God's Word says this, you know, and that's, I don't think that's what you understand. And they, whatever way they put it, whatever manner in which they put it, sometimes it is dealt with as if they have tried to tear them down and they ought not ever to do that. And what it reflects to me, and what reflects, I think, to everybody if we really look at it and analyze it, is pride. Pride. A sense that there's nothing you can tell me about my life. There's nothing you can, where you have any place in my life to suggest anything to me. But beloved, and I don't have time because I'm, I'm already down a rabbit trail I didn't intend to go down here. But if we go through the Scriptures, it is clear that sanctification is a social work. It's not an individual work. And we are to provoke one another to godliness. We are to encourage one another. We are to restore one another in the spirit of meekness. We are to suggest corrections where necessary. And I don't mean we do it with pride or we do it in the sense of being puffed up. And I'm not saying that we all should be meddling in all others' affairs. I'm not saying that. But if someone does come to us, being sensitive should never be the response. We should listen to what people say. They perhaps see things that our eyes do not see. We are a work in progress, and others may perceive things in our lives that we have yet to learn. Now, signs of a heavenly, of a heavenly people. We looked at that. We saw those signs, the unity, the truth, and we ought to be fighting for truth, beloved. Truth within our own lives, but predominantly the, the application here is this, the truth which God has, has entrusted to the church and to the people of God we aren't to let go of it. We are to stand fast for truth. And so when society comes and says, 
God's word is irrelevant, we don't take their side. We say, no, it is still relevant today, and I hold to it no matter what you say. And we are to stand against our adversaries. We aren't even to flinch. The language of verse 28 is telling us we're not even allowed to flinch and nothing terrified. Don't even flinch whenever the enemies come and try to oppose you or get you to subside or, or to give up on the truth. We move then into verses 29 and 30. Having seen the signs of a heavenly people, we see here the suffering of a heavenly people. When he says, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which he saw in me and now here to be in me. As we consider the suffering of a heavenly people, I want us to see, first of all, the provision that brings suffering. Now, he begins in verse 29 with the word for, which pushes us into the previous statement, which says, but to you of salvation and that of God, where we see here that what happens to the child of God when opposition comes is not outside the control of our God. We believe. I think there's a general consensus here. And if there's not, then I trust that God will give you grace and light in His Word to realize that God is absolutely sovereign. We don't believe in a God who gets surprised. We don't believe in a God who can't control things, that He stands back and spectates in the affairs of man's life. We don't believe that. Even in the affairs concerning the Son of God, everything that happened was the determinant counsel of God, Peter tells us. He is sovereign. I am not setting aside the responsibility of man. No, but... It is clear God is in control of things. And even when it comes to the affairs of the afflictions that come by adversaries who try to attack us and tear us down and get us to surrender truth, get us to go back into a sinful lifestyle, give up the Word of God, when they come against us, that's still under God. That's still coming by God and by the very permission of God and the very will of God. But to you of salvation and that of God is a sign of that you're a child of God and it's all coming because of God and God wills it. And that is developed in verse 29. He is develop, developing that idea of God's sovereignty in our suffering. For unto you it is given. It is given. On the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. The word given gives the idea of it being a gift. The idea of conferring something upon another. When I looked at all the usage of this word, it, it was different. I mean, it confer, conferring forgiveness, conferring uh, various types of things, but really it's the conferring of something upon another. Paul is going to use it in Philippians 2 verse 9, where it says there, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted Christ and given Him a name which is above every name. He had conferred on Him a name. It's the same word. And the same word is used in Romans 8, 32, where it tells us, He that spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? He confers on us all things because of what He has done in giving His Son up for us. But what does this bring about? That's the question. What does this do? This gift, this that God has given to us. I mean, who, for example, or first of all, has it been given to? It's to them who believe on Him. That's what it says in verse 29. To believe on Him. It is given to believe on Him. You could really summarize it. And so the experience that is being discussed here in verse 29 is exclusive for the child of God. It's not for everybody. It's only for those who are Christians. So if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, but you're suffering, Paul's not talking to you. Whatever your sufferings are, he's not talking to you. He is talking to those who believe in Jesus Christ and them alone. But the question is, how did this come about? How did they believe on him? I want to deal with this before we go any further. Did they just wake up one morning and say, oh, I'm going to believe in Jesus today? 
that they have ultimate control in the fact that they believed in Him. I want you to know, many of you do already, but I want all of us to understand that faith is not something that originates with ourselves. Faith is not something that is born in ourselves. It is something that comes from above. It is something that is given by God. He makes the dead to live, and what follows is the gift of faith to believe the gospel. Ephesians 2 verse 8, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. The faith that comes, grace from God bestows faith in the heart of every child of God. And it's nothing to do with yourself. It's outside of you. It's not God doing most of it and you adding a little bit to it. No. The true salvation as revealed in the Word of God has faith as a gift that comes entirely from the law. 2 Timothy chapter 2, the latter part of that chapter, Paul writes to the young servant that the servant of the Lord must not strive but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. This is a word to me. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, those who go against the truth and doing damage to themselves. If God, peradventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. So you look at it exclusively in the latter part, they recover themselves, but look at how they recover themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. It's a gift. And when you go through the Scriptures, you find that both faith and repentance, as highlighted by Ephesians 2, 8 and 2 Timothy 2, we find both of them are gifts from God. I can't even repent without God bearing it up within my heart. The text that we're looking at also enforces this idea. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe. I mean, Paul could have written, it is given on behalf of Christ for you to believe. But they knew that. That was more well known by those at Philippi. I mean, if they read verse 6 of chapter 1, they would know that as well, because it's God that begins the work. But that was more easy to grasp. God has given us salvation. The question is, what about our suffering? What about that? And that's what we're going to be looking at as we go through this text. But we're looking first at this idea. It's been given on the behalf of Christ not only to believe on Him. We have been given the gift to believe on Jesus Christ. And that's a glorious thing. Because when I think of myself, if it had been up to me, I never would be a Christian. Never. There's nothing in me that seeks after Jesus Christ. Even as a believer, my flesh, I feel like Paul so often. The good that I do, I do not. I, this, 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 this desire to do good doesn't always get accomplished because there's this conflict of interest between what I know to be right and what my flesh wills. And so if that's my condition in a regenerate state with the life of God and being a child of God and adopted into the family of God, how much more hopeless is my condition without any life? I have no desire for Jesus Christ by nature. I hate Him. Jesus makes it clear in John 3. Men love darkness. Why do they not come to the light? They love darkness. The only thing that brings them to the light is the sovereign working of a sovereign God in mercy. And if you're a child of God here this morning and there's one thing you can rejoice in, and if you don't get the rest of it, you can rejoice in this. God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us, He has set that love upon me, and I now today am a child of God. Hallelujah! Because whatever I'm facing, that can't be taken away from me. I'm sealed to the day of redemption. But the point is, not only given to believe on Him, He is using that as a basis to say God has given this, but also, look what He says, also to suffer. 
We are to suffer. We are then, as the people of God, to recognize that what follows salvation is suffering. <laughs> and we live in a time where we hate suffering. We don't really know what suffering is, for the most part, but we're so averse to it, we will avoid it by every possible means. You just don't want to suffer. Hedonism, that's what we're after, isn't it? Hedonism. It's all about what feels good. And suffering doesn't feel good, let's avoid it. Well, child of God, as it has been given to you to believe on Him, it's also been given to suffer. And we need to get a hold of that. Secondly, the purpose of suffering. What's the purpose? Well, it's to suffer on the behalf of Christ. It has been given on the behalf of Christ. And there's these two little phrases. It's, it's kind of awkward in a way, but really what Paul is doing is saying the same thing twice. It is given in the behalf of Christ. Salvation has been given for Christ's sake. But also suffering has been given for Christ's sake, and that is underlined when he follows up also to suffer for his sake. So the main subject is suffering. And we are called on the behalf of Christ to suffer. We are called to do it for his sake. And this is what gives us encouragement when we realize that we're suffering. Realize that salvation is a package deal. That it comes with suffering. You don't get one without the other. So if there's someone here this morning and you say, well, I'd like to go to heaven, but I don't want the suffering that Christianity brings, you can't be a Christian. I mean, this is the parable of the sower, isn't it? And Jesus starts telling us about the, the way, the different responses to the preaching of God's Word. There are those who receive the Word with joy. And for all intents and purposes, when you look at it, it seems as if there's real life there. But then something happens. They face persecution. They face hardship. And they wilt in the heat. And they die. Proving, not that you can be saved and lost, but proving that the root of the matter was never there. Because when God does a true work, again, verse 6, if He's begun the work, it will be performed until the day of Jesus Christ. We are called to suffer. Now, the question is, what is the suffering we're called to experience? Because I know what we're like. We're, we're, we're selfish, aren't we? We are, we are always thinking about ourselves. And right now, you're thinking about your suffering, aren't you? And you're thinking about how my particular suffering at this present time, God has given to me, uh, along with salvation. And there's a sense of truth in that. And there are passages I could turn to and say that applies to wherever you are. You could say, I'm suffering in this regard, and I could turn to the Word of God and say, look, yes, God is in control of this. You're suffering for, for this purpose, and God will glorify Himself through it all. But in the context here, it's not whatever suffering we want to desire. The suffering, contextually, is that which comes by way of enemies of the gospel of Christ. It is that suffering which comes for having to take a stand for Jesus Christ. It's that suffering which your family may confront you with when they are annoyed that you won't go to uh, their drinking parties or they are annoyed because, uh, you know, maybe your children aren't Christian and you're saying, no, you can't do that because I, that goes against God's Word and they, you, get, they, they, you get all the angry language that teenagers can sometimes throw at their parents and they're angry because you would do that, but you're doing it for the gospel, and they hate you, and they say they hate you at least with their language, but it's, it's, for, it's your stand for the gospel's sake. It's that kind of hatred that comes from your boss, who's always forcing you to do the overtime, who's making you do the certain tasks. It's that suffering that comes whenever he won't let you get promoted, even though you're the best person for the job. It's that kind of suffering that comes along whenever colleagues talk about you and and kind of isolate you away from themselves, away from them. It's that kind of suffering that comes whenever we bring the gospel to someone and they hate us for it. Or our neighbors despise us when they see us getting ready to go to church on a Sunday morning. 
And we know they don't like us and they don't like what we stand for. It's that suffering that comes when someone point blank asks you, what do you believe about homosexuality? And you tell them what God's Word says and they hate you for it. This is the kind of suffering that Paul is dealing with here. It's the kind of suffering we have to endure when we own Christ. It's not physical suffering in the sense of I have a certain ailment. It's not suffering that comes by reason of whatever it might be. It is particular in this regard, these persecutions that come from those who hate the gospel. And as I say, it comes with salvation. So if you didn't know that before, you know it now. And the words of the Scripture are clear over and over again. 2 Timothy 3, verses 10 to 12. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. I wish I could say this. You've known this. My doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. But out of them all the Lord delivered me. And then he says this, because we might say, well, that was just Paul's life. That's what Paul experienced. All these sufferings and persecutions and afflictions. But look what he says. Yea, and all. Underline it. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. There's a comfort there, isn't there? We realize, well, I'm not alone. <laughs> Everyone here as a child of God has had this. Everyone. If you've been on the Christian road for any length of time, you've had this. I am absolutely certain of it. Whether you've had it at school or at work or in the home, in some way you have faced this because all. And God wants us to experience something of what our Savior experienced, and so every one of His people go through this. I quoted it in Bible class, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 14. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but run away from it. <laughs> no, rejoice! Oh, if we could only get this into our hearts. Inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. And we're going to see Paul talk about this in chapter 3. That I might know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings. He had a prayer to know more intimately what Jesus Christ suffered. Not just in the head as he read the account of the Gospels of what Jesus endured, but to know by his own experience the affliction that comes upon all that live godly in Christ Jesus. He actually wanted it, to identify more with the Lord. No, he wasn't a hedonist. He wasn't looking for the easy way out. Rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings that when His glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. <laughs> if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the Spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part He is evil spoken of, but on your part He is glorified. And there's certain application there we could make to what uh, verse 28 actually said when we looked at it last week but will not do that. So, some of you are suffering this in the workplace, some more than others, but all will suffer. We all will go through this. And you're living or working with those who oppose the gospel. Take what Peter says to heart. Don't think it's strange. It isn't odd. You're not living in an ungodly way. In fact, if anything, it could be telling you that you're actually living godly. Because all that live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. There are various reasons to see the purpose in our sufferings in this regard. It promotes assurance, first of all. 
Many of us struggle with assurance, but when we have to make a decision about whose side we're on, it helps. It helps when we're called to make a decision. Whose side am I on? Will I butter up to my boss when he wants me to do something that contravenes the Word of God? I work as an accountant. Somebody comes and says, fiddle the books. No! Get another accountant. Not going to do it. And then you suffer for it. Threat of your job, breaking the contract. You get all of that. But then, on the other side, you get the sense, well, this is what it's like to be a believer because if I had my way, I wouldn't do this. But the Lord gives grace. It's not persecution when a brother points out a legitimate error. When we're committing some sin and someone gives us grief about it, that's not suffering. And Peter deals with that later on. Being suffering for the fact that you're acting like a thief and so on. That's not suffering. But when you take a stand for truth and you're opposed, well, it, it promotes assurance of salvation. It gives us a sense that we are the Lord's and we identify with the sufferings of Jesus Christ. It also promotes separation. Because it's hard to be worldly when we're suffering for Christ. It separates us. And Jesus talks about this in John 15, verse 19 and 20. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. <laughs> it's like this, as simple as this. <laughs> you're either in the world or you're not. And if you're mine, they're going to come at you if you're truly living the Christian life. If you claim to be mine, but you live like the world, then there's something wrong. You're probably not the Lord's. But if you are the Lord's, you'll be on His side. And that brings the world as your enemy. And they hate you for it. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. So if they're for me, they'll be for you. If they're against me, they're against you. We are in the world, not of the world. And it will be obvious to those who are of the world that we are not of the world. Should be. And young people, you need to take that to heart. All of you. That you're not of the world. And it should be clear to all around who are of the world that you're not of the world. You have to be different. The gospel calls us to separation. It promotes the gospel. When we are persecuted, it spreads the gospel. You think of Acts chapter 8, whenever those who were persecuted at Jerusalem and they were scattered abroad, they were pushed out, and they went everywhere preaching the word, it tells us. And bring that into modern terms. You might not have persecution that will drive you out of your home. That day might come. It might. I trust not. I don't will it. I don't pray for it. I don't desire it. I've heard people pray for it. I've heard people, I've sat in prayer meetings where a Christian is praying, Lord, bring persecution upon us. And that is not the will of God. I know there's this thought that if persecution comes, it will purify the church and I'll make things much easier as you see all the nonsense and drivel and dross be driven out. I know that. But we are, as much as is possible, to live peaceably with all men. We are to desire peace. But not to compromise truth in order to get it. And there's the difference. But if we, we could be driven out of our jobs. Take a stand. I've given some scenarios that could see you Cut off. You won't do those books that way. You're fired. Well, you're being scattered abroad. That's how I would see it. You're being scattered abroad. God has somewhere else for you to serve. You can be faithful there. It promotes the gospel. It promises an eternal reward as well. Matthew 5, 10 through 12, what does Jesus teach us? Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. And you could just put in there for Jesus' sake, because it's the same thing. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you. I think I need to read that slower. 
Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. In case you didn't get it, rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. The reward is not in this life. Jesus isn't saying you'll get popularity and you'll be the most popular person at school for being a Christian and you'll be the most popular person in your workplace for being a Christian. You'll be the most popular person in your street for being a Christian. No! But the reward is an eternal one. Quickly, the pattern of suffering. Verse 30, having the same conflict which he saw in me and now here to be in me. There was no one in the church of Jesus Christ that those at Philippi loved more than Paul. He was the one who, whom they, they so naturally were drawn toward. And rightly so. I mean, he set up the church and it wasn't an easy road, was it? He comes into Philippi and he brings the gospel and God saves a number, but he suffers for it because he is wrongfully imprisoned. And he's not just imprisoned. They take him and they beat him and they whip him and they tear his back to a pulp. And they leave him in the stocks. He rejoices in it, he and Silas. And those at Philippi realize what's happened. And what the Lord did through him. And they love him for it. And they knew all this. And they thought about it. And we read about it in Acts chapter 16. And so he says, having the same conflict which he saw in me, you're having the same conflict which he saw in me. Why? Because the enemies that were there in Philippi when I passed through are still there. Even if they on their individual basis had died, well, the great motivator of evil men, Satan himself, will always have someone else to do his work for him. And Paul actually talks about what happened at Philippi when he writes his letter to those at Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians 2, 2. Verse 2, even after that we had suffered before. The reason he's writing about this, by the way, is because after Philippi went to Thessalonica, and so he's giving context of what happened in going to Thessalonica to the Thessalonians. But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi. We were shamefully entreated. It was wrong what they did to us. And so everybody knew and so he is saying, you're having the same conflict which he saw in me. What you're going through is the same conflict you saw in me. Am I go was I going against the will of God? No. But how did I respond to it? I stood fast. And nothing terrified by my adversaries. So that when they threatened me with that whip, I wouldn't recant. When they left me there bleeding to death, I was at midnight singing praises to God with Silas. And you remember what God did with that? He saved the Philippian jailer. Saved his whole household. And then he says, and now here to be in me, the suffering you, you're hearing about me. And he mentions his bonds, doesn't he? In verse 7, 13, 14, 17, he talks about the fact he's in bonds. Epaphroditus carrying this letter back to Philippi, no doubt, told them more details about his afflictions. And so they get the report and they understand of his sufferings. And he's saying what you're going through is what I went through and what I'm going through. And so, beloved, we go through it together. Because all that live God in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The enemies of the gospel will come against us all. And so as I close this, I want us to get a hold of this. Heavenly living will lead to suffering. You want a heavenly lifestyle, you want a lifestyle of suffering. Because the heavenly life is not at home in a volatile environment like this world. It's not at home. Heavenly life doesn't belong in this world. And I say to young people, learn early that suffering is what you will face. If you take a stand for Jesus Christ, you will face suffering. It is inevitable. And for those of us older, I trust it's the same. We understand this. So don't deny the Lord by laughing at filthy jokes. 
Don't enter into conversations where the topic is wretched in the eyes of your Lord. If you fit in there, there's something wrong. You're not living heavenly. You say, I want to be heavenly. Dear God, make me heavenly. Then I cannot be partaker of their evil deeds. I must separate from their attitude and spirit. And the same goes for anyone here in the workplace or in any environment where you're confronted with compromise. Your Christianity is a sham if you're not willing to stand against the vile discussions in the office. If you're not different, then you're not different. You get that? If you're not different, you are not different. And we're here this morning because we claim to be different, claim to be believers. I say I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. But if I am not different to those who don't follow Him, then I'm not different. The only difference is in my schedule, at certain times of the week, I come to church. But I'm not different. Because I'm not living the heavenly lifestyle. Only let your conversation be, let your citizenship be as becomes the gospel. Let it show that you own the gospel. It must be on show for everyone to see. And don't sit there and think that your pastor doesn't know what it's like. I know what it's like. I've been there. You have to take a stand before God and that stand is mocked by your colleagues. I've been there. I've worked around the foul mouth. I've worked around those sharing the filthy jokes, passing around rubbish and nonsense and that which is horrendous in the eyes of God. I worked with a professing Christian one time who used to give me grief about certain stands I took, certain beliefs I had about my, the strictness of my faith. He would give me grief and he would do it in the presence of the ungodly. He'd give grief. Try to make a mockery of someone trying, no failing often, but trying to live a heavenly lifestyle. Mocked it. Until one day, he got me alone, and he was weeping like a child, pleading forgiveness, acknowledging that he was backslidden and not where he should be with God. The world know, and they should know that your life is a life that reflects the heart of God. They will hate you for it, and even some professing believers will, but they are not your model. We are to live the heavenly lifestyle. And I say again, the heavenly life is not at home in the volatile environment we call the world. And you will suffer just as our Lord did. So let us embrace it. Let us rejoice, as Peter tells us. Let us realize that this is what our God has called us to. That our present afflictions are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. Let us be more heavenly minded. May God bless his word. Let's bow together in prayer.